Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. morning. Hey, well, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and it is such an honor and a privilege to... Man, I just love our pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. I think on a regular basis, like on a weekly basis, about how grateful I am for the opportunity they've given me to, to be here, to serve you guys, and just grow in what I'm doing. You, do you guys know that I'm actually growing? Can you believe that? I have not arrived. And if you doubt that, ask my wife. I have not arrived. And uh, interestingly enough, this week, I had this beautiful message planned. It was beautiful. Like, it was probably one of the best messages I've ever prepared in my mind. Uh, it was about God as the Logos. We've been talking about the names of God, this series Name Dropper. A name dropper is somebody who uses somebody else's name to get access to something that they couldn't get on their own. And uh, we are invited. God invites us to use his name, to call on the name and his character in our lives and, you, and, and use that to our advantage so that we can move forward into all he has for us to be. And I had this beautiful message about the Logos. And I was laying in bed Wednesday night, stressing and freaking out, partially about the message, but partially about an expense that I had come up. And I'm like, dang, inflation is getting me. And then I started thinking about inflation. And I was like, man, why is it so expensive and this and that? And, and then I started thinking about politics and that got me all riled up. <laughs> and uh, I'm laying in bed for two hours. Just my mind will not shut down. Like three to 5 a.m. Anybody relate to that? Yep, yep. And then the poor person that lays next to you was like, oh my God. And I said, Lord, I just, I just need peace. And then I remembered one of the names for God is Jehovah Shalom, which means God, our peace. And I thought, you know what I need more right now, more than logos, which is ultimate truth. I need peace. And here's what I've learned. If I need it, you need it too. In fact, the more I need it, the poor, probably the more likely I need to talk about it. Uh, because, so basically, this message this morning is for me. And if y'all want to listen in, that's cool. Okay? <laughs> Actually, the guy get mad at me one time. He came up to me and he's like, hey, I can't believe you said this message is for you and not for the congregation. And, and I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm way more concerned about my spiritual growth than I am about yours. And he looked at me, and I was like, I'm serious. If I'm not growing spiritually, like the dude that's up here speaking, if he's not growing spiritually, we're doomed. So, like it or not, this message is for me. Jehovah Shalom, God is our peace. Now, here's what I know about all y'all. All y'all, everybody, at some point in your life, you're just going... I just want peace. The kids. The kids. I just want peace. They're fighting. Mom, 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 mom. Some of y'all, that's all too real. Some of y'all are remembering back to when it was all too real. Mom. Mom. Dad, 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 yeah, just what? And, and then, but she, she did this to me and he did that. Look, I don't care who started it. I just want peace. And some of y'all just go, man, I just want peace. And, and here's the crazy thing. Like some of y'all know that there should, there's some stuff you should be doing, but you're just like, I just want peace. I know I should be paying more attention to what my kids are watching on TV, but the, the TV keeps them busy. So they're not going, mom, 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 all the time. And I know I should be paying attention because I know there's probably some stuff on TV they shouldn't be watching, but I'm just so tired and exhausted. I don't have the energy. I just want peace. Some uh, some of you, there's an in your relationship, like you know there's some stuff that you need to have a conversation with your spouse about, but you're going, oh, as soon as I bring that up, I'm going to be walking on eggshells for days because he never responds well when I bring that up. She never responds well. Marcus said she. No, not Pastor Natalie. (laughs) They. (laughs) 
We've all got areas of our life where like, and, and some of you, man, you're like, and here's the really self-sabotaging thing we do. We all say we want peace and then we unintentionally do things that disrupt the peace. I just want peace. And then we keep 24 seven news on, which is not about keeping you peace at peace. It's, it, it's about keeping you riled up. I used to watch the weather channel for peace. You can't even watch the weather channel for peace no more. Do you realize that like everything's an apocalyptic storm about to come? Last night I was flipping through YouTube and it's like, La Nina is coming. Disaster awaits. And I was like, oh, we're all going to die from La Nina. A phenomenon that's been happening for 300, 500, 2,000 years. Who knows? But I'm like, well, I, I want to know how I'm going to die about it. So I go and watch, you know, and I'm watching this thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, is that, should I cancel my trips? Like, so I want all this peace, but I do all this stuff to sabotage it. Anybody relate to that? So there's this story. It's one of my favorites. Uh, it's about a guy named Gideon. And Gideon, he lives in Israel. But uh, as is the story in the book of Judges, in the book of Judges, Judges 6 is what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Judges 6, basically every chapter in Judges starts with this. And the children of Israel did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And then crap happened. And then God sent a prophet. And then he sent somebody to deliver them. But first, it had to get really bad. That's the whole book of Judges, like every chapter. No exception with the story of Gideon, which is where we first see the name Jehovah Shalom. God is our peace. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. These were some neighbors. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. They had to actually flee their own homes and go hide in the caves. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern people invaded the country. So they'd plant their stuff, and then people would just go and take it from them. Right? And this wasn't even the U.S. government. This was, an, an, a, foreign, this was a foreign government. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah. Yes, that is where Oprah got her name. Seriously. I have a joke, but I'm not going to say it. That belonged to the Joash, the Abiezrites, <laughs> where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So here's the visual. These people are out there oppressing Israel. And so this dude, he's just trying to like provide for his family, mind his own business, and he's hiding out, threshing wheat in a wine press. Usually he would thresh wheat out in the open so that all the chaff would fly away. But he's like, if I do it out in the open, people are going to see me. So he's just trying to kind of fly below the radar, not draw any attention to himself. When an angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and this is the irony of this whole thing. Here's a dude hiding out to not get caught. And here's what the angel says to him. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Uh, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this bad stuff happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Tell all the stories about the stuff he used to do, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of activity, Lord, because things seem to be going downhill really, really fast. Why aren't you doing something? I'm not getting a lot of peace here. But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Valid statement. Now, what I find fascinating is, is apparently, I mean, if this had been an angel with a flaming sword, I'm, not, I'm thinking Gideon wouldn't have talked back this way. Just my guess. So this dude must have just appeared kind of as a normal person. Says, hey, mighty warrior. And he, and he starts kind of bantering back and forth. He's like, I'm not, I'm not so sure about anything you're saying here. The Lord turned to him. Now, isn't that interesting? It's shifted, like, it's from an angel to the Lord. Wait, what? The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? This is fascinating. He says, God, when are you going to save us? And he's like, you go save Israel. I'll go with you. Well, wait, I'm looking for a miracle here, Lord. I just, just, can you go just fix it and then I'll come out of the wine press from hiding? I'm just trying to provide for my family here. 
I, I, I know I should do a little more. I know I should step up. I know I should engage. I know I should push back a little bit on all this cultural junk that's going on. But I'm just trying to provide for my family. And I don't, I'm, and those people, they're going to take my stuff if I go after them. They're going to cancel me. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but uh, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Like, not only am I not from an important group of people, I'm like from the not important people of the not important people. And I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, don't matter. He didn't say that. That's my translation. I'll be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So, I mean, just picture this. Here's this guy. This guy's kind of trying to just hide out, fly below the radar, you know, do his thing, p- provide for his family. And God's like, I need you to step up and be more. And he goes, I'm not so sure I can be more. I don't know if I've even got it in me to be more. So Gideon, I love this guy. He always pushes back. He says, all right, look, all right, that's cool. I see what you're trying to say here. But look, if I've found favor in your eyes, can you give me a sign that it's really you talking to me? There's this uh, Chris Rice, he was a, a singer, and he used to say, he had this one song, and it would say, I would take no for an answer just to know I heard you speak. Anybody relate to that? You're like, God, even if you tell me no, you can't have that, just hearing your booming voice would make me feel really confident. Can you give me a sign? And instead we get nothing, but it's crickets. And you're like, God, I need a clear sign. And then when he does speak, it's about something you totally don't want to hear. Please. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it up before you. And the Lord said, all right, I'll wait till you return. Now, my mind flashed to something that's fat. I thought this was interesting. Maybe it's not to you, but it's interesting to me. And this message is for me anyway. So here, this, Gideon, he says, I need a sign. And you know, when Jesus came to earth at one point, he said this, he said, a wicked and perverse generation looks for a sign, but no sign will be given to them except for the sign of Jonah. And then he just like walks away, like, mic drop. This is Jesus, right? He's like, and people are like, he doesn't clarify what the sign of Jonah is. And there's all sorts of conjecture about it. What I think it means is you're going to get your sign, but it's not going to be without some major darkness and travail. You're going to be swallowed by the belly of the whale, and eventually you're going to reemerge. Because what happened to Jonah? He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, wasn't he? He was running the opposite direction of where he should have been going. And God's like, no, son, I'm going to show you. And then this storm erupts, and he knows who causes the storm. And he's like, all right, guys, throw me overboard, and everything will be taken care of. So they throw him overboard. A fish swallows him up for three days, and then eventually after three days, the fish spits him out, and Jonah's like, I guess I need to go do what I'm supposed to do. Isn't that a picture of all of us? But yet on the other side of that, oftentimes, I don't know, maybe this is the way it has to be. Maybe we have to run from the call for a while and then face a lot of darkness and then emerge on the other side and go, oh, wow, have I got a story to tell of God's faithfulness. I got swallowed in the darkness, but now I've got something to tell. And maybe that's what Jonah needed before he had a real message for Nineveh. I don't know. There's my random PS. Just a thought I had. The Lord said, I'll wait for you until you return. So the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Now remember, food's at a premium, right? H-E-B has run out of stuff because the Midianites have taken everything. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. This line right here really spoke to me. You're not going to die. You've got a mission to accomplish. And sometimes, man, you get to a point in your life where everything is changing so much. They call it the liminal space. Life is changing so much that you go, I don't even know who I am anymore because everything has changed. And it can feel like you're dying. And I'm just more and more convinced that when you come to the place where you're convinced it's over, 
That's actually just the beginning. And Gideon had to have been looking around and going, it must be over. Like, there's no way it can get better. There's no way the world can get better. The way things are going, it's not going to get better. We're weak. We're oppressed. All these people are taking advantage of us. And then God shows up and he's like, I got a job for you, buddy. I'm going to use you, one man, to save this nation. And he even gives them a sign. And he says, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. Now, a couple of observations. Nothing had changed in Gideon's situation. He was still in a wine press, hiding out. The Amalekites were still running the place. Midianites, everybody was running roughshod over the whole country. Nothing had changed, but all of a sudden, Gideon kind of stands up straight and puts his shoulder back and goes, the Lord is peace. Here's the really crazy thing. Life had just gotten a lot more complicated for Gideon. God said, I need you to come out of the wine press, step up and be the man I've called you to be, to be the warrior I've called you to be. And still in the middle of that, Gideon recognized, hmm, the Lord is peace. Nothing had changed. In fact, it had gotten even worse. He had a lot, a huge task ahead of him, and he didn't even feel up to the call. But still something about it told him, it's going to be all right because God is with me and he is peace, which brings me to my first point. True peace doesn't come from absence of conflict. It comes from awareness of his presence. We talked last week about the power of recognizing God's presence even in the most difficult of situations. There's a verse in Psalms that says, even darkness isn't dark to you, and night is as bright as day. And a lot of times we equate the darkness with evil, but here's the really crazy thing. God is so all-powerful. He's not just in the light times. He's also in the dark times. And that's what real faith is. It's when you can identify God in the dark times. It's easy when it's Sunshine and unicorns plants prancing through the sky. It's easy to identify God then. It's really hard when it's dark. And a person of faith is one who says, it's really, really dark. In fact, it's so dark, I believe God is right in the middle of this. I just can't see him. That's, right. That's, right. Yeah. That's true faith. So you're looking around for peace, and we all want external peace. And we often say, man, if I can just get these kids out of the house, <laughs> peace. I'll have peace I'm looking for. Man, if we can just elect the right government, the right person, oh, we'll finally have peace. Man, if I can just get this certain amount of money in the bank, I'll have peace. But what we see from Gideon's story is that true peace doesn't come from absence of conflict. There was still all this conflict around him. In fact, there was a big conflict he was called to take on. It comes from awareness of his presence. And when you read the Bible, man, there's like four layers. If you really want to read with wisdom, there's like four layers that you need to read the Bible with, okay? Um, First of all, there's the literal level, like what was the literal story of what happened? But you get in trouble if you just stick with the literal level in the Bible because there's more to it. The the Bible is so perfect. It's more than just a literal story, okay? You've also got the moral component of the story. What is this story saying I need to do, okay? Okay. That's the moral component. Then you also have uh, like the uh, analogical component or the mystical component saying, where is this leading into the bigger picture of what God is doing? And then there's the metaphorical component, putting yourself in the position of the characters and seeing how they interact with God and saying, what what does this mean for me? And in this story, I think the powerful message is is this, Is, is this my second point right here. We don't fight for peace. We fight from peace. Now, you got to understand something here. Peace is not a default setting. Peace will never just happen. Someone always has to pay a price for peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace we now stand, it says. Apostle Paul said that. Our peace with God came at the price of Jesus' death. And peace in your life is never going to come because you're hiding out in a wine press and avoiding conflict. Unfortunately. 
It's not going to go away. One of my dad's favorite mottos is, there's no problem that won't go away if you ignore it long enough. <laughs> and I'm like, no, dad, no, no, <laughs> that's not it. Because here's the thing, oftentimes the price of peace, uh, it, peace right now, avoiding what you need to do right now in the name of peace will actually create more pain later. Letting the kids just be educated by TV and watch the TV because it's like, well, at least they're quiet. You're going to pay the price for that later. Oh, man, going to the gym, it's so, it disrupts my peace. I just feel so much more peace when I eat ice cream after my water burger. And look, there's nothing wrong with a little indulging here and there. But if you're living on a steady diet of that kind of peace, it's not going to be really peaceful later when you're hooked up to stuff in your nose and you're, you know, they're digging around and like it, it, the price of peace right now, it could be pain later, but the price of peace later is often suffering right now. Yeah. Doing the thing you don't want to do because you want peace down the road. <laughs> Financially, Dave Ramsey says, live like nobody else today so you can live like nobody else tomorrow. Yeah. Financial Peace is the name of his program. <laughs> peace is what we all want. But here's the thing about it. If you're fighting for peace without peace in your heart, you're going to become part of the problem. Last week, uh, this Hamas supporter in, um, in London went and destroyed this very famous painting of a guy named Balfour. And somebody said, why did you do that? He said, look, we just want peace. So we're destroying things so we can get peace. <laughs> Doesn't work, right? Destroying things for the peace. Now listen, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, when I was talking about uh, wanting peace late, uh, earlier on, you have to qualify that, right? Like when I'm talking about peace, the peace has to be internalized peace. Otherwise you become part of the problem. Right. And how many people have you seen protesting for peace in the streets while they're burning down other people's stuff? You can become part of the problem if you're not operating from a place of peace. And this is the beautiful thing where Jesus comes in, God comes in, and he says this. He says, look, you're not just going to be able to sit idly by until peace just shows up on your doorstep. You're going to have to make some choices and make some decisions. One of those is to get control of your mind, Joel. Got to get your mind under control, Joel. You can't let it run off crazy, thinking all these negative things, thinking all these worrisome things. You've got to at some point stop and go, hey, stop. Stop thinking that way. You got to wake yourself up and be serious about it. That's where I love this verse. In Philippians 4, Jeremiah already quoted it. We, haven't, we didn't practice this beforehand, but Jeremiah quoted this. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you want peace in your mind, first of all, you've got to recognize what is lack of peace. And you've also got to love peace, because let's be honest, some of y'all don't love peace, you love drama. We like drama. It gives us this adrenaline rush, but once the adrenaline starts to wear off, you just feel exhausted because you can't keep that adrenaline level up all the time. So he says this, don't be anxious about anything. Oh, easy enough for you to say, Paul. No, he, he was serious about this. He says, but here's the thing. When you recognize the lack of peace that's going on in your heart and mind, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And I think that thanksgiving is the key. Meister Eckhart, he said, if the only prayer we ever said was thank you, that would be enough. Something happens when you shift your mind off of all the chaos around you and start to go, thank you, God, for what I have in front of me. Sure, it's not like I thought it would be. It's not what I wanted it to be. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift my eyes and just say, thank you, thank you, thank you, and shift my perspective. And when you start to do that, man, it's amazing how there's this old song that says, turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you want peace, it's going to come at the price of a battle. But you fight for peace from peace. And you say, God, 
I need you to come in and fill my heart and my mind, all these worrisome things, all these concerns I have, all this frustration I have, all this anger, all this resentment, all this bitterness. If I try and fight that from where I'm at right now, I'm going to become part of the problem. If I try and fight the lack of peace around me, I'm going to become part of the problem. But I'm going to find peace, first of all, in you. And then as the peace starts here, it flows out to everyone around you. And my, my prayer for us is that we may be people of peace. Because with peace, you've got strength. And that's the beautiful thing. Before Gideon went to fight the battle, he first of all recognized, I'm going to fight this battle, but I'm going to do it from a place of peace. And if you read the rest of the story, Gideon barely has to lift a finger. He has to do the work. He has to do the work. But the battle is ultimately God's. And he started from that place of peace. And he just obeyed. And the crazy thing is God kept stripping resources from him. God kept going, hey, you got too much. To, you're going to think you won this battle. And he's like, let me take that away. He's like, hey, if you do this, you're going to think you won this battle. And he keeps stripping things away. And Gideon ends up with him and 300 guys. And they beat an entire army. But it was all because one man had the courage. And he started from Jehovah Shalom, with God being the center and the place of peace. You guys receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you don't ask us to drum up peace on our own. <laughs> you are the source of our peace. So I pray for anyone this morning that's got, maybe they're like me, man, and their mind is just going crazy. And they wish, I just wish I could shut my mind off. Lord, I pray that we would be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, we would present our request to you. And we know the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. People look at it and go, oh, that doesn't even make sense. It transcends all understanding. Will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning and you do not have peace with God, peace always comes at a price. Jesus paid the price for you to have peace with God. If you have not accepted that gift, I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, God is going to come and forgive you your sins and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in the kingdom of, kingdom of light. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you back there right under the do it again sign. Man, I pray you guys have a blessed week. Listen, invite a friend next week to church. Next week is also our Easter offering, which is going to be going towards missions. This is the week where if you invite them, they'll probably say yes. So use all that people capital you've been gaining and say, hey, come to church with me. I, I'm, I'm almost certain they'll come with you. Next week, four services. Yay, five. We have a sunrise. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Just remember that. Say it together. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Service times. Be blessed. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.